Morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to session three in our art and design series for Created. I'm Jean Hale. I am a freelance consultant. I've been working with Culture Bridge for a while now and devising the Created series, looking at how we implement the arts in the classroom. I'm really pleased to say that we've got a kind of a double session for you today. Um, this is the third in a series of three. And Rachel Thompson and Jenna Fryatt have run a session each. And this is our final session. And we are going to make it as practical as possible. But also, there'll be time for you to go into breakout rooms and have a chat about the experience of the course and, and that sort of thing. Uh, I'm going to hand over very quickly now to Rachel um, uh, and Gemma. Rachel's going to introduce the session. I'll let them both introduce themselves. Thanks, Jean. Hi, everybody. I'm Rachel and I work for an organisation called Access Art. I noticed Susan is here. Hi, Susan. He's one of our lovely trustees. I work for Access Art. I have done for about seven years now. Um, we, we support schools and teach art, basically, um, in, hopefully in a really inspiring way. That's one aspect of what I do. Um, I'm also an artist and I work predominantly with watercolours and with dry materials as well and layering them together. I am doing I'm part way through a master's qualification in fine art at the moment. And some of the work or things I'll be doing with you today are sort of linked with my area of study um, for the MA. Um, so I'm hoping that some, some lovely conversations can go back and forth. So lovely to see you all. Um, Gemma, do you want to say hi? Hi, everybody. Nice to see you all today. So my name is Gemma Fryett. I run a business called Creative Minds where I go into primary and secondary schools. I deliver sometimes the curriculum, um, but quite the majority of the time now, I work with vulnerable pupils, kind of using the arts therapeutically to engage in communication, bonding, and to kind of support them in kind of whatever way they need at the time. Um, and that's kind of my background. Um, thanks. Okay, lovely. So I'm just going to quickly go through what we'll do today um, before we move on to some practical activities. We, we want today to be, you know, nice and relaxing and, and enjoyable for you. Um, so we're thinking about today about um, art really being a really broad subject, something that can feel a bit overwhelming sometimes, but we want to try and open up some thinking today about um, ways in which you can provide opportunities that embrace what art can be and how you can broaden it out in your curriculum. So less perhaps about a teacher, the sort of the, the kind of setup where you've got a teacher that's um, relaying or recounting um, knowledge um, in a way that they might do for another subject, um, but more, more about creating opportunities for children to really discover what art is and what it can be, what it can mean to them and embracing that teacher and um, child can go on a, on a journey together. So and one thing that um, I think is quite important about art, which I certainly feel keenly myself at the moment, grappling with all sorts of work that goes wrong and you know, it doesn't work out how I want it to be, is just, just always knowing and feeling reassured that the learning never finishes with art. Um, it's not like something that can be completed um, and, and, and then you're done. Um, but that's actually a really good thing. So um, I think it's it's just worth sort of keeping that in mind as, as you go through today, but also go going back into your settings afterwards. And I wanted to just sort of add that when we say, when we're talking about the word broad here, I don't mean, you know, ways to kind of make the art that we're teaching really, really big, really, really dramatic, um, much, much bigger and better and everything like that. Um, what I mean by it, what we mean by it really is it's sort of a mindset thing. So making it sort of to do with how you approach it. So if we if we embrace the fact that it's something that can kind of carry on, that we've never quite finished learning, then it's it's a really lovely way to kind of keep building um, some really great experiences, experiences for the children you're working with, or um, if you're not in a school in, in the setting that you're in. You're all from different settings. I know some of you are art leads, so you know, we'll have, we'll have lots of experience, plenty of experience teaching art or facilitating art um, amongst your staff in your school, um, which is great. So um, it'd be lovely to hear any of your thoughts later on when we come to discussion. So just, just a brief outline for today. We're going to start with a little warm up in a few moments, a couple of minutes. There'll be some practical activities as well, some longer practical activities delivered by myself and Gemma. 
And then we're going to sort of have um, the second half really of today is going to be a breakout room discussion. So we've got a question we wanted to pose to you to get together in groups and have a little chat about. And then we'll come back as a, as a main group to feedback um, some of your thoughts. And then we'll, we'll have some time at the end for questions as well. Okay, so I'm hoping you've all got some watercolours with you and some watercolour paper. Um, if you want to sort of get yourself comfortable with your paints in front of you, water pot, your brush um, and your paints, obviously, just get yourself set up. We're just going to do a really gentle, quick warm up. So, like I said, I work mostly with watercolour and so I thought it would be appropriate to use mainly that material today. I wanted to do a little warm up with you, really, that's just about connecting with, with what watercolour can do, but also thinking about when we're thinking about um, how we're teaching art that idea that it's not one, you know, we, we learn something and we finished it, we've learned something and we finished it, that it keeps on moving, that it keeps on evolving. So in a sort of artistic way, I wanted to kind of, um, I wanted to sort of embed that image, as it were, with you as we work through a little warm up. If you are all ready, I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, so get your brush nice and, nice and saturated with the water. Just go with what colour you feel is appealing to you. I'm just going to go with an orange mainly because it's a little bit easier to see. Now, what I love about watercolour is just the way that it flows around. And I want, I want you to imagine that you are just travelling around the paper and just allow the line to move around. And we're thinking about that journey through art and how it just keeps on going and that it weaves in and out. Just, just allow the brush to move around. I'm doing, I've sort of gone to circular motion, so I'm making a sort of spirally kind of shape, but that might not be the shape that you're making. So do just feel free to find the shape that works for you. And just, just be aware of the feeling of the brush on the paper, the tension of the bristles. Be aware how the paint is moving over and crossing over lines. And already I can notice, I have already feel like I've learned something about what watercolour does. You know, I've got these darker lines that I started with. Um, but they, very quickly the paint has run out of the brush and the, the colours become paler and I've created different tones on the page already. And the colours over, overlapping and interlocking. So I'm just noticing that about the paint as I'm moving. And um, if you're doing this with children in a classroom, just, just encourage them to observe those characteristics of the paint. Okay, when you're ready, choose a different colour. We're going to create more of a journey. We're going to we're going to interlock that journey a bit more. Okay. Now, whatever shape that you you have began, begun with, you might have done square, or you might have done zigzags, whatever you've done. Choose something that's a bit different for this time and just create a conversation between the two colours. And just notice what happens. So I've already, where I've got quite a little wet patch here, I can see that the, um, the paint is bleeding in and I'm just thinking, okay, I'm just going to add a bit more in there. Interesting. Just see what happens when those colours collide. So I'm creating some angles now. I've, I've sort of, I've done my, my circularly, spirally shapes and now I'm doing squares. So again, you know, imagining that, you know, we're all artists, we're all artist educators, we're, we always, we're, we're, we're working with art in some way or another whether it's once a week, whether it's every day. And that journey through teaching it and through learning it and through experiencing it keeps on moving. And it interlocks and it never ends. Okay. So I've ended up with, well, I don't really know how I would describe it, but it kind of doesn't really matter. It's a sort of, it's a series of different marks and shapes. Um, using a medium that is really versatile and flexible. Um, and what I love about um, in watercolour is that 
you can kind of see things emerging on the paper as you're working with it in real time. Okay, so I'll just let you finish up the last few lines that you are working on. Okay. So when you are ready, if you want to just put that piece of paper to one side, I do encourage you to keep it. Um, let it dry, look back on it a bit later on, reflect on it, um, because you never know, it might spark some ideas, it might spark an idea of some kind. So we will move on when you're ready. We're going to move on now to um, our longer activity. Um, I work a lot with landscapes. Um, when I say landscapes, I use the term quite loosely. And so I wanted to bring, um, I wanted to share a little bit about my process of how I might um, create a landscape today with the hope that it might sort of open up or broaden um, what you feel might be a landscape or how we might facilitate um, children painting landscapes. So I call these watercolour landscapes from imagination and memory or all memory. It's a sort of mixture of the two. Um, and really the aim here is to understand that landscape painting isn't always representational. So um, of course, we, you know, we'll be familiar with um, sort of oil landscapes, lots of the lots of the old masters or uh, painters like Constable, um, Suzanne, and thinking about um, looking at paintings that are sort of quite representational, um, we can identify different things and um, they're largely painted with oils. Um, so I wanted to push that a little bit, push against that a little bit and think really about bringing in um, how we think about colour and the different types of moods and emotions that colour um, might evoke. Um, now, um, quite often hot and cold colours are, are talked about in schools and um, children sort of experiment using um, colours that they feel might be warm or cold. Um, but, you know, I th and I think that's fine. I think um, that, you know, perhaps there might be the sort of scope that being um, different for different children. So to sort of define what is a hot colour and what is a cold colour isn't the only way that we can learn about colour. So just pushing against that slightly, thinking about um, different, different colours and different feelings that they evoke. So when you're ready with your um, next piece of paper, we're just going to create some little spaces now on the page. And we are going to begin with, with hot and cold. Um, so um, I just invite you to select a colour that you feel is cold and just make a little mark of it on your paper. I'll share again with you, but I'll share my screen in a moment with you as well. So, when you've got your colour, just working quite quickly, just make it, just make some marks of that colour, like a little sort of area, contain it within an area, um, it doesn't need to be square, it could be whatever shape jumps out at you. Just enjoy the feeling of that paint on the paper. And then we'll go with a hot colour. Is that a red or an orange? Or is it something else completely? Because your perception of what a hot colour might be, it might not be somebody else's. So it's important to go with what, where your intuition leads you. So we're making little colour patches on your page. And what I'd like you to do next is we're going to use some different words. And I'd like you to work quite quickly here. So I'm going to sort of say the colours, to say the words to you, um, relatively short space in between, because what I want is for you to just use your instinct and use your feeling about that um, that word and then choose a colour that you feel represents it to you. Okay, so we'll we'll begin with ominous. So an ominous colour. So what colour is ominous to you? Lively, lively colour. So we're making these colour patches. But try and recall some of the marks that you were doing in the warm up. So we were letting that brush move around. We were enjoying the feeling of the, the flowing nature of the watercolour paint. So it's nicely. 
Okay, peaceful, peaceful colour. I think there's quite a lot of research, isn't there, into the into green being quite peaceful. And just notice whether, as you're adding each of these colour patches, whether the marks that you're making are varying. So I just thought green peaceful, and I, and I just made a horizontal sweep across the page there. Hopefully you can see that. I'm going to just add a bit more so you can see it because the sun is right on my. So just just observe and reflect, you know, okay, you're changing the marks, what does that mean? So if you were doing this in little sketchbooks at school, you know, you'd have your, it might be nice to do this on a double page spread. Okay, turbulent, turbulent color. So just work quite intuitively. If you get a color down, you think, oh, I don't know, actually, that's not quite right. That doesn't look turbulent enough for me. Then choose a different color or mix two colors together. You know, allow the paint to collide a little bit. I mean, when I, turbulent makes me think of a storm, really. So I sort of went with a kind of a cloudy, almost like a, a dark cloudy kind of shape, adding in the color as I go. Okay, so hopefully you've now got a collection of different marks, patches of colour on your paper. Um, and um, you might want to make a quick note with a pencil what those different, um, those different words were and um, just as a, as a sort of visual reminder to you. Um, and then, you know, what I would say is that you can, if you're building up a collection of of marks in this way, that you're then able to look back on those to refer to those if you are building it into a longer piece or bringing in different um, working in other ways. And you've got those, this is sort of a record. And that's really, that's really how sketchbooks work. We, we create um, a record of things that we can go back to and, um, you know, it helps us develop those ideas. So I'd like you to just have a look at them, have a look at your images in front of you. And then when you're ready, to either turn over the paper or find a fresh piece, depending on how much you have with you. Don't worry if the paint is still wet on that side, it doesn't matter, it gets a bit smudged. Closing a sketchbook or whatever, I was in a school last week and um, doing Egyptian hieroglyphics and there was so much worry over paint not being dry and putting the sketchbooks away and things like this. And I was trying to reassure them that, it, you know, a little bit of smudging in a sketchbook that really doesn't matter. Um, and in fact, you know, it, it just shows things in real time a bit more and you never know what might happen actually when you create a bit of a smudge because that might in itself spark an idea that happens to me quite a lot you know you sort of almost create an imprint of the page on one to the next okay so with a fresh piece of paper now and we're thinking about the paint and we're thinking about the colors that we've used we're thinking about the way in which we can apply the paint on the paper and the, the qualities and the characteristics it has i'd like you all to now just think about a place that you know, and so imagine a place that holds one or more or a mixture of these emotions, these words for you. So it might be somewhere that you know, but it might be somewhere completely imaginary. So if we're thinking about the word ominous or turbulent, maybe we are thinking about a stormy sky. Um, if we're thinking about peaceful, maybe we're thinking about somewhere we've been that felt, gave us a sense of peace. So it's personal to you. And I won't be asking you to share what that place is, but this is completely for you to just enjoy. So imagine a place that holds one or more of these feelings, these words for you, or, or imagine a place that you think might hold those words. Okay. And we're not going to be using pencils for this. Um, I'd like to go straight into brushwork because sometimes if we begin with pencils, it can actually inhibit. Um, where we go, the direction of the painting it can kind of restrict. There's certainly a time and a place for pencils, but I think right now I want to keep as fluid as possible. So hopefully you've got your place in mind. I just want you to begin marking out that place with paint. Now, 
really, I mean this really loosely, okay? And I, and I don't mean a formal composition. What I mean is try and see if you can evoke a sense of that place with the paint, evoke that feeling that it creates. So, and just begin to mark it out. So we're not thinking about formal, you know, here is something, here is something, but just allowing the paint to kind of take us through the journey when we're, as we're thinking about that particular mood. So it could be that you're thinking about some movement in some tree, maybe you're, the place you're thinking about is um, a woodland area. How might you show movement through trees um, with paint? What does that shape look like? You know, it, it probably wouldn't be a zigzag shape or an angular shape. It would be something that might flow a bit more. Um, or, you know, are you thinking about the way that sunlight might cast down on a particular landscape or a particular place? And how does that look, you know? or maybe a storm. So we're thinking through that place and the feeling, and, we, and we're transferring it through the marks on the page. Now, it's, it's a challenge to do this, and it is something that doesn't always come that naturally, but it takes a bit of practice and exposure to get it. And it's about allowing the forms to just kind of reveal themselves on the page to allow it to develop. And I should say that if you do feel that pull towards, you know, you're, you're thinking about a tree and, and, you know, this sort of woodland area, say, for example, and you find yourself, you know, a tree starts coming out of nowhere, then that's fine. Don't, you know, that's not wrong. You haven't done it wrong. Um, you know, but it may be that you you sort of, you really, Okay, I'm drawing that more representationally now, and I've got this tree that's coming in, um, and that's fine. But don't don't fight against it too much, but just try and remember to connect back with um, that feeling. And okay, so I, I've got I've got a tree in there, but how can I now? What what happens if I um, smudge that tree across the page a little bit? Is that then the wind blowing through that tree? Um, is it autumn time in, in the, with this, for this tree, are those, are those leaves turning brown? And does, when the wind blows through them, are those leaves being blown off the tree and cascaded through the rest of the landscape? And if that's happening, then how do I do that with the paint? So hopefully that makes sense. So I'd just like just to invite you to just take a few moments to just enjoy that process. And I'm going to add to mine a little bit as I go along. If you, if you want to have a breather and just watch for a minute, that's absolutely fine. And if, as you're working, you, you feel like you get to a point where what you're drawing or painting isn't, perhaps where you feel like you want it to go, or you or something jumps out at you and you think, well, oh, that little area there has worked really, really well. I like the way those two colours are colliding. But you want to try that, you want to push that idea a bit more. Then go to a different area of your page and, and start again and do another one, or find another piece of paper and do another one. There's no sort of um, set, this is where this landscape painting is beginning and this is where it's ending. Um, and in fact, when I'm painting, I never have one piece, um, I, I never do one piece at one time. So the way I work normally is to literally have about six, seven pieces of paper in front of me on the table or on the wall. And I work on those pieces concurrently over a 
period of time might be a day or several days or whatever you know, whatever time I pick up to do to, to work on it but there's something really liberating about knowing that the piece that you're working on um, isn't necessarily going to be anything um, it might it might simply find its home folded into your sketchbook or in a pile or just stuck up on the wall um, but that's absolutely fine and, and then in theory, gradually, gradually, gradually through engaging this process of using the paint in this really organic way, um, but having that sort of the context in mind, this sense of place, whether it's a moorland or a beach or, uh, you know, somewhere on holiday, we've got that as our sort of, it's our backup, it's our, our image bank, as it were, in our own minds that belongs to just, just to us. And we're just, we, we, it's about allowing that to kind of find itself on the page really naturally. And it is it is hard to do, um, but it it, it does um, gradually. You can um, evolve these little sketches, these little bits that go wrong, these you know countless reams of paper, whatever. You know, eventually you might get to a point you think actually no, that really works, and I want to refine that a bit more. I want to make that into more of a final piece, and then you might start layering it up a little bit. Or in my case, I'll start adding in some dry materials, so some charcoal or pencils over the top. Um, so it's really, it's really a sort of um, a really organic kind of process. Now you would have noticed when we did the warm up that watercolor, if it's not got too much water around it, which of course sometimes it does, but if you've got areas that were painted on quite dry, then those areas will be dry enough after just a few minutes to to work over the top of, and that creates a lovely effect. So you've got this sort of almost this bleed through effect. So I'm sort of indicating a sense of some kind of um, mountainous landscape. But I notice that I'm always drawn to blues. And so quite often it's. You can't really distinguish what might be land or what might be sea because they kind of blur together a bit. So just have a notice what what's evolving, what's emerging for you on your page. Do you feel when you reflect on it, do you feel like. You can you can get a feeling of the place that you are imagining and that's for you to to reflect on and you know you might want to make a few notes you might want to jot down some thoughts or images that pop into your head um, and again if you are in school um, then this is a nice moment to encourage the children to do the same thing um, you know it doesn't have to be paragraphs and paragraphs and certainly in sketchbooks you know one word two words little labels here and there um, that just kind of remind you and anchor you back down to where you were in that moment when you were painting because it is easy to forget you know if you are doing lots and lots of it you want to be able to kind of remember oh yeah I remember which material I used then and, and what the what the starter inspiration was for that Now, depending on how many paint brushes you have with you, if you have got another paintbrush, it might be a good moment to, to test that out and to try some different marks. Um, if you've been using mainly the, the side of your brush, have a little go. Maybe there's some little details you want to bring in that use more of the pointed end of the brush or a whole, you know, involve holding the brush more upright. If that's appropriate to the to the to the place that you are evoking, if it's not then it doesn't matter. And just see what happens, see what evolves. You know, maybe the place that you're painting is changing in front of you. Maybe it's becoming more joyful, um, or maybe it's becoming more ominous. Um, and just notice that shift if that is happening. You know, as we bring in colours, as we bring in different marks, what happens to the sense of place? What happens to that landscape? Watercolour is really great for um, creating a sense of depth as well. You know, it's I think um, it can be a bit of an overlooked medium in some ways. It's not traditionally, well, it is used for 
lots of paintings, but it's such a different paint to oil. And I think if you can keep pursuing with watercolour and just finding out what it does, it can be really liberating and open up all sorts of possibilities for creating different types of paintings. I can see you all um, still look, you're still working away, which is fab. I hope that you're enjoying what's emerging in front of you. Just give you a couple more minutes to finish up your imagined or your imagined landscape or your landscape from memory. If for the last moment or so you want to bring in some pencil over the top or bring in a dry material over the top, then do um, feel your way through that. Um, the reason we didn't start with that is because there's, it's very easy to, and it's fine because sometimes you do want to do this in this way, but it's very easy to kind of mark everything out and get it all set and, you know, rub it out, all oh, that, that bit's not right, I need to change that bit. And whilst that there's certainly scope for doing landscapes in that way or any kind of drawing and painting that way, when you, there's something very different about going straight in with paint um, and watercolour is a really fantastic paint to do that with because of course you know you can blur it out quite easily you can um if there's a little bit that doesn't go right you know you can smudge it away to an extent but it is great to go straight in with the paint but as it dries and if that the, the landscape that you are creating now if it's beginning to form in front of you then is there any bits that you want to tease out a little bit more with some pencil to create a bit more definition even if that's just some little marks or a little bit of um, some shading or whatever to create some depth or some shadow, and then just just instinctively kind of mark that in, begin to mark some that in, just while we just um, for the last minute or so while we finish up. Okay, so just um, invite you to finish the marks that you are making, or just take a moment to finish them. And just to finish off, I wanted to just share a couple of things. Um, we're obviously talking today about broadening out what we're teaching, how we're teaching art. Um, and this has obviously been an isolated activity, these landscapes. Um, but if you were thinking about these landscapes in, in the context of a broader um, range of activities or broader, broader project, um, looking at landscape um, or looking at watercolour, um, there's different things that you could add to either side of it um, to really create a, a fully immersive project. You know, so you might you might begin if you were if you were delivering this in, in schools, you know, you might actually see this as a one lesson in, in, in a series and you'd absolutely want to sort of really begin with that discovery of what, what watercolour is so that when we did that warm-up earlier something akin to that um, so experimenting with the wet and wet technique when you wet you wet the paper first and then you add the, the paint in and it creates this lovely bleeding effect and um, also the wet on dry technique as well which is um, self-explanatory really um, you know you, you're, you're painting um, the wet paint over something that's dry so you're allowing areas to dry and then doing painting over them um, and again layering with different materials so that's a whole sort of area sort of pocket of experimentation that can happen before you even get to talking about that scapes and then bringing in things about colour and, and feeling and emotions so when we looked at those words earlier peaceful joyful turbulent thinking about colour and and how those um, how they can bring forward those emotions what they mean to us so that's a whole other little pocket of experimentation that keeps on building this project. Um, and obviously going outside. So you know, if, you have, if you're lucky enough to work in a setting that's got maybe a school garden or any, any kind of tree in the playground, whatever, um, get outside, go and draw it, do some observation, write some notes, um, um, have some discussions about um, places, landscapes, or places that you've been to that hold a memory. Um, so that you know, it doesn't have to be a landscape, it can be any kind of place, but a place that holds some feeling for somebody. Um, so that's a whole other little discussion and a little pocket of the project. And of course, you know, don't forget about looking at some artists who might um, be painting landscapes. Um, you know, not obviously we, you know, there's, there's plenty of historical artists that you can look at, but have a think about some contemporary artists as well. And um, don't forget that there might be some artists in the local area who might be able to offer some expertise in how they approach landscapes. Um, and so then what you can do is when you when you come to creating the, the, the sort of, I don't want to use the word final, but the, the piece that we've done today, um, you know, when you get to that point, you've already got some sort of, you've got some things already that you've done, some experiences that have been had that you can then draw on. So it's not 
case of sitting down for one hour on a Tuesday and we are going to paint a landscape. It's what can we do before we do that? And also what can we do afterwards as well? Because that's really important. My tutor at the moment says to me that what's the, well, I can't remember the exact way he phrased it, but you know when a, a piece has been successful, a piece being a, a painting or final drawing, because it tells you where to go next. So, you know, the, it, it's, it comes back to the, the, the concept that art, the journey of learning, it just never ends. So we want the children to you know, have something on paper, but that something can lead somewhere else as well and to allow them to embrace that opportunity for us as well, to embrace it as educators. OK, um, I wanted to just finish by sharing a quote from a, a, an artist I really admire, William Kentridge. I hope you can see that OK. It's just on Word. If that's OK. Um, so William Kentridge is a South African artist and, and he, for him, process and journey, and all of those things are absolutely central to his practice. He's, he actually has a mania drawing practice. So he works in animation, but um, I thought even though we were working with watercolor today, it was still relevant. So he says, making art is a practical activity for me. It's not sitting at a computer and thinking through an idea. It's embodying an idea through a physical material, paper, charcoal, steel, wood. I think a central category is recognition. And for that to operate, you need to have an open field. If you have a very set plan of where you have to walk, where the drawing is going, it makes it much harder to allow yourself the openness to also see what's arriving by chance through fortune and at the edges. So I just wanted to end on that to kind of distill um, hopefully a sense in you that, um, you know, it really is not having, you know, going straight in with the paint, not always having a plan can really um, broaden how we might approach painting and drawing. Okay, so thank you very much, everybody. I think, um, God, that's sunlight. I think that leads us to. So I think we're. I think we're ready to go again, and I think I'm going to hand over to Gemma, who's going to take us through the next part of the session. Okay. Hi, everybody. So what we're going to try and do today is reverse monoprinting. Um, and my kind of background over the years has been predominantly textile, so I kind of concentrate on print, on really expressive drawing, using obviously like inks a little bit, but my kind of area is print. And what I want you to do is kind of, I've taught this reverse monoprinting um, from reception to about year six, so I've kind of adapted it to make it really, really accessible, okay? So it's a very much a simplified version, but hopefully it's something that you can absolutely do in a classroom with 30 okay the first thing that we need to do is kind of start to get set up which will take a little bit of time and obviously on the um, equipment list was tin foil so uh, what I need you to do you're going to be working on obviously we ask for A4 paper so you need to make sure your piece of tin foil is obviously big enough for A4 and what I want you to do is to fold your tin foil in half so it's got two layers and then you're going to use masking tape to tape the top and to tape the bottom onto the table in front of you so that's going to be flat on where you're working okay and obviously if you are working with children that are quite young I always put tape along the full of the bottom and the top but you can also do the sides as well obviously because you can still catch your fingers and things like that if you are working with really really little ones but obviously just make sure your piece of tin foil needs to be at least the size of your A4 paper for this to work. So if you want to just take a moment and kind of grab your tin foil and then just mask and tape it just to the table in front of you so it's not going to move. If you do have your tin foil obviously already prepared and it's it's taped down, the next thing obviously in the equipment list, but I'll just show you what they look like just to make sure you've got the right ones, is the two printing rollers and it is quite important that we do need um for this printing process so obviously these are got a red handle obviously a black roller sometimes these are in different sizes you can get ones that are quite big or quite small the size doesn't matter at all um, as long as you've got two of them that's absolutely fine so just make sure they're kind of to hand as well is everybody almost ready i think so Obviously, we're using the tin foil today. I have tried reverse monoprinting with a number of different things. And this is the easiest way I've found to do it, especially with children. So I've even tried, I've laminated a piece of A4 paper 
to give myself a flat surface before, but to be honest, washing 30 of them afterwards is an absolute nightmare. <laughs> so I've tried all sorts of different ways. And this at the moment is the e by far the easiest way I've kind of found to do it. So as long as you're kind of all set, I think everybody is almost back now, I think, aren't they? So as long as you've got your tin foil and you've taped it down flat. And obviously, as I said, if you are working with very young children, tape the edges as well because you still can get it's almost like a paper cut with the foil um which isn't very nice um, and the next thing you'll need is obviously your block printing ink and i'm going to use black today because it's you'll be able to see it much clearer um but you can use whatever color you want and in terms of experimenting with this afterwards you can combine colors you can kind of do ombre effects you can mix them it's no different to mixing paints so you kind of can explore that afterwards if you want to and um, but today obviously I'm using black more because it will show up much better on the tin foil for you to be able to see and what we need to do now is we're just going to have a tiny bit of ink you don't need a lot and um, sometimes people obviously I'm going to do mine stood up which is a little bit different to normal um, but what I'm going to do you don't need much and it's best to start with just a small amount and then you can always increase it. So you can always start to roll out the ink and then add a little bit more if and when you need to. Sometimes people tend to put lots on, but then it kind of makes everything very slippy, which I think if you're young and you're doing this is obviously going to make everything a little bit trickier for you. You're going to take the printing roller and what we're going to do is we're going to roll the ink out to a, a little bit smaller than your A4 sheet of paper. So you don't need, obviously you're gonna have a big piece of tin foil underneath. You don't need to cover it from edge to edge and roll out the ink really thinly. So with reverse monoprinting, it is a better idea to keep that ink quite thick, okay? And I'll explain why later. So if you want to start rolling out your ink, so push it away from you, then lift it up and just to kind of make that square shape. I'll keep mine quite small. I'll try and make sure that you can all see it just so it's not too big and you want to keep that ink quite thick so don't roll it out too big just keep it quite small and you're kind of just making a square shape to be honest it doesn't matter if it's not perfect or if you can see little tiny bits of what the tin foil underneath it is okay as long as the as long as you've covered most of it I'm just going to kind of make a square shape for you. So you want to keep it quite small and quite thick. I'm not sure how much experience you've got, obviously, with monoprinting, but with your normal kind of monoprinting, you roll it out very thinly, but for reverse printing, you, it is best to keep it quite thick. Now, obviously, when you're putting your rollers down, this is what this edge is for. So this is where you're going to rest your roller. And then what I want you to do is, obviously one of the things that we asked for in the equipment list was the cotton wool buds. So what these are for is basically, and again, I've kind of tested lots of different ways you can do this, but this is really good as well with little ones. So as I said earlier, like I've had even as young as reception to kind of do this activity. And basically you're using the cotton bud to wipe away the ink. And to get them to start this, I always ask them to think of a shape. So if you think of one shape, you start it in the corner and then you're going to want them to repeat it. So you're going to end up with a repeat pattern at the end of it, which is obviously really good in terms of the curriculum because you're ticking off more of those kind of boxes. So if I start, I'm going to start in this bottom corner, I'm going to do a semicircle. And you literally very carefully, obviously you do have to be careful not to rip the tin foil, otherwise you have to start again but you're just gonna repeat that pattern, okay? So you're gonna wipe the ink away. You'll notice it'll kind of get fluffy at the end a little bit. So then you have to swap to the other end and very carefully just wipe away the ink. And then obviously once you've got, you do you go through quite a lot. So obviously just pop the ebo down. I've just got a clean one and just keep going. So just keep wiping away the ink. That's kind of what you want to do. 
and you just keep repeating that pattern. So if you've chose a square, a triangle, circles, it's absolutely fine. You can do whatever shape you want to do. And as you're wiping away the ink, one thing you do have to kind of be aware of is if you're starting to kind of, you keep doing your repeat shape and you think I can't see the tinfoil very clearly anymore, just go back over it. So you have to make sure you can see that shiny foil underneath. That's kind of what you want. So just keep going and keep filling that square. And the really good thing as well about the drawing ink, the monoprinting ink, it's not going to dry quickly. So you do have time to do this with the class. It would take quite a long time for this ink to dry. So it's not really in a rush. You can just take your time and do it, which is quite nice. Well, you can feel free to go back over and if there's any parts where you think I can't see that foil very clearly just go over and give just literally wipe it away okay so now what we're going to do is you're going to place the A4 piece of paper so this is just printer paper that I'm using so just literally the paper that you get out of the photocopier it doesn't have to be a heavy paper it can kind of I think sometimes this lighter paper actually works a little bit better and you'll see why in just a second. So you place it over your reverse monoprinting. You now take, so this is the clean roller with no ink on it, okay? And that's quite important. So you, I have to obviously hold your piece of paper just on the edges. And what you're going to start to do now is roll over your ink. And as you roll over it, you can be able to start to see your pattern coming through on the other side. And try and push quite firmly. And just go over it a couple of times just to make sure you've kind of gone over every part of it and you haven't missed anywhere. Okay. And if you just set your other roller down and then you're going to peel this away and then on obviously a piece of paper this will be your reverse monoprint and obviously when you're doing your repeat pattern you can kind of choose to add as much or as little detail if you want so you could go back into these shapes and kind of do more mark making and kind of take away more ink if you want kind of more of an elaborate shape that's absolutely fine Has everybody found that okay? Yeah. So what we're going to do now is we're going to keep going with the monoprinting and we're going to add some collage to it as well. Okay. So if you just set that print down just to one side that you've done. And the really good thing as well about the tin foil is you can kind of do this as many times as you want as well. So now we're going to do another one and it's literally just a case of popping a little bit more ink back on and then rolling it out again. So you don't have to get rid of it. You don't have to move it and have a fresh piece. You can kind of just keep going as many times as you want that day. It's absolutely fine. So I'm going to put a little tiny bit more ink on. Exactly the same amount. So it's kind of about the size of a five pence piece. That's kind of what I'd put out so you really don't want too much because then otherwise it, it does make it much harder and what we're going to do is we're going to slowly just roll this ink out and basically you're just kind of erasing whatever work you've done and obviously make sure you've put enough ink on that you can't see what you've just done so it should roll out over the top quite easily. If you've started and you think you might need a little bit more ink, that's absolutely fine. You can put a little bit more ink on. So just take your time and just roll it out. It can be the same shape, it's absolutely fine. Just that kind of square shape, a little bit smaller than your A4, just so it makes it a little bit easier for you to do. But obviously by all means, if you're in the classroom and you want to kind of go a little bit bigger, then you can make the tin foil really big and kind of go as big as you want to. Okay. And then again, we're going to use, so once you've rolled out that ink, so you're ready now for your second one. And I've just kind of made sure that I've gone over so you can't see what I did last time. So I've gone over all of those semicircles so you can't see them. Okay. 
I know what I want you to do now is you can do a shape or if you want to, you could do a series of lines, zigzags. You can kind of just kind of make any type of pattern you want in the ink. So I'm gonna kind of try and experiment maybe with some lines with this one. So using the earbuds again, and you're literally just very carefully wiping away the ink. So obviously just being careful not to rip it. And then just keep wiping it away. And then just set them down just as soon as you need another one and just use as many as you need to. And if you want to, you could add in more details. So I'm going to do some circles as well. But you could combine anything. So you could um, try and do a drawing that's based on a topic that you've got, which would be absolutely fine. If you do just want to do prints, I always do something quite a lot called line and dot drawings, which are really nice because they're kind of very creative doodle in a way, but you can by all means kind of do whatever you want to do. Kind of add a couple more circles, but just try and fill whatever area you've got. So you kind of fill as much space and maybe push yourself a little bit more and do kind of maybe more detail than what you did on the first one. Just so you've kind of experimented a little bit with it. Okay, so once you've done that bit, so that is exactly the same as what we did last time. Okay. And now what I want you to do is with the A4 paper that we've that you've got, I want you to start and you could just literally cut maybe two. So I have these kind of shapes that I've made and it's just out of A4 paper. So if you take the scissors and obviously the A4 paper and kind of you can make just even two just random shapes, like a triangle. Obviously, if you're in school as well, what I do find is that there is those do you can get the scissors with the kind of crinkle edges and things like that. The children love kind of exploring different cut marks and things like that. So you can kind of explore all the different edges that you could do. So I've kind of cut some triangles into this one. You can have just a triangle shape or just literally just a curved line. You can kind of, even as you're doing it, you'll get really interesting off cuts as well, which are really nice. You can kind of explore those too. So kind of, any kind of scrap paper you've got, to be honest with this one. I think I'm gonna try and use these two. So if you just take a second, just cut out any random shapes. It could literally be even just two triangles would be absolutely fine. Okay, so now what we're going to do, and the good thing about this ink, because you put it on quite thick and the ink, the, the block printing ink does take a long time to dry. You can basically, it's much easier obviously to work flat, but obviously today I'm on like the easel. And you're going to stick the collage piece of paper to the ink. And you're going to kind of just consider where they're going and consider kind of making those nice shapes and kind of changing it a little bit. And they do just very easily stick. So obviously working on a table on a flat surface is much easier. But even with this with the easel, because the ink's quite thick, it will just very, very easily stick into place. And then again, you get just the A4 printer paper. And we're going to put this back on top. Okay. And again, you're going to take that clean roller. Okay. So it's the one with no ink on it. And just hold your piece of paper just in place. And you're going to push really firmly. And just go over it a couple of times just to make sure you've got everything there.
and you can and to be honest, you can use a heavier paper if you want to if you kind of want to work towards final pieces or anything like that but i think i do think the beauty of working with just the a4 paper just literally printer paper when you're pressing it with the clean roller you can see it appear in as you're kind of rolling out so you know when it's ready but obviously with a thicker paper you're not going to get that and we're going to very carefully peel it away and then you'll be able to see now kind of just where I've kind of got my collage pieces so you've got kind of the zigzag lines coming through the triangles that are kind of creating different shapes as well and then the really nice thing about using these pieces is I always find once you've peeled these off these like little pieces that you've got I'd always keep and kind of use so you can keep these and stick them to kind of more reverse monoprint later on because you'll see as I peel them all off sometimes these ones have like really lovely prints on them and they're kind of like just really nice accidents that you kind of never thought that would come from it so I'd always keep these and use them as collage on top of another reverse monoprint as well and we will try use these if we have enough time so if you peel the piece of paper you have left that are just stuck on so if you peel them all off and just set them to one side Are we doing okay for time? Yeah, you've got about another sort of five, seven minutes. Okay, brilliant. So what I did want to do um, for the last one, so maybe only fit one more in here. I was wondering if you could get the spiral watercolour that you did with Rachel. It was just a warm up. So it wasn't the landscape, it was just a warm up that you did. Okay, so that's what we're going to try and use as our paper for the last one. So again, so you do it exactly the same way. So you're going to put your third little bit of ink onto this one. And we're going to roll it out. Just keep it in the same area. So just kind of, again, you're kind of erasing just what you've already done. Just very slowly just cover what you've done and to keep it quite thick. Your ink might be starting to dry a little bit, so if you do need more ink, just put a little bit more ink on top, because obviously now this is the third layer. So I might put a little bit more ink on mine just to make sure there's enough. So just roll it out and just keep it really nice and thick. And again, so once you've rolled out that ink, you've covered up what you've done from the last one. You literally just take the cotton buds and you can kind of go with the shape or if you want to you can kind of go with a line and dot drawing so using just lines zigzags wavy lines kind of whatever you want to do um, i think this one i might start with wavy lines and the really lovely thing about pattern and print is that there isn't really a wrong way to do it you can kind of do whatever you want to do whatever works it could be a really nice mindful exercise, which is really nice and calming. I think sometimes when you're not drawing anything in particular and you've kind of encouraging the children to kind of doodle and just to make marks, it's a really nice therapeutic thing to do. Just because there is no pressure to attach to it if it is just pattern. It's kind of whatever you want to do in that time. So I've kind of gone with wavy lines at the minute. Feel free to add more shapes in if you want to do 
add different shapes to what you've already done. So you can do dots, squares, triangles. Just keep repeating whatever you're doing. So try and do just more than one of anything. And I think you'd be surprised at kind of, as you're kind of doodling and just letting it kind of go, you always kind of get more and more ideas and your ideas might start to change. So then rather than wavy lines, you might go with really straight, long lines. You could do those really thick or really thin. It really, really doesn't matter. As long as they're kind of exploring, mark making, and obviously they're using the printing process as well. Kind of try and fill that area that you've got. I'll do just some more straight lines just at the top here. And obviously now there is three layers of ink on, which is quite a lot. So she might need to use more of the cotton buds just to make sure that you can still see that tin foil underneath. Okay. And what I want you to do just now, so if you are finished with that part, this is so I've got this this is I always have lots and lots of these kind of hanging about because it's just basically I love using drawing inks so whatever I do when I kind of do one I kind of keep it so if I've been demonstrating I kind of keep hold of them um, but the drawing inks are lovely to use especially in class just because the pigments are so strong and they're so vibrant they can they can be very very interesting um, so what I want to do now is I'm going to use this as my piece of paper so we can see it on a coloured background. But that's why I'd really like you to use your spirals, the watercolours that you've just done, just the warm up exercise, just so then you're kind of combining techniques. So you're mixing media and it's kind of elevates it. So it's all much more exciting when you start to explore it. If you do have any offcuts of the collage pieces as well, I would encourage you to use those too. So I've got this kind of piece that I've got. So I'm gonna put this just right in the middle, kind of maybe going diagonal. So stick down any of the extra collage pieces that you've got to hand. So I'm gonna use this instead of the white paper, just so you can see what it kind of looks like. So pop that down. And again, we're gonna use the clean roller that we've been using. So just hold it steady and push really firmly. If you have used slightly thicker paper while you've been doing the watercolour, I would suggest pressing a little bit harder with it. Just because the thicker paper will be, it's just a bit trickier to print on top of than the printer paper. But just give it a really good push. And then you can see here, pull this bit off. So you can see, so this is the inked background with the reverse monoprint on top. And obviously when this dries, obviously it will be a little bit wet at the moment because obviously we've just printed on it. But if I pop this here, can you still see that? There's kind of, and obviously these, this was just kind of like the off cut pieces that we used. So these pieces though would be lovely to kind of, again, once they're dried, you could cut up and you could start to collage with them and kind of add them to your work. So you're kind of layering up your print. So then you've got your line and dot drawing, you've got your reverse monoprinting, you could have included watercolors and you've included collage. So you kind of, the levels of mixed media and experimentation, a kind of building and that's kind of what you want to combine all the different kind of areas and techniques. Okay, do you want to hold up what you've done? Would you want to hold up one of, you could pick, because obviously we've done three I think now, um, if you want to hold up what you've done just so I can have a quick, a really quick look and it's just a good idea. Brilliant, I like the squares. Very good. 
Very good. I really actually like the watercolours and the... Well, you could put it on top of any kind of background, which is absolutely fine. So if you've got scrap bits of paper lying around or if you've got even stuff like tissue paper or anything like that or some metallic paper that's been left over from Christmas project or something, you could play about with collage and to print on top of it. And again, you can always change the colour of ink. So I've gone with black today, but only because it's more obvious. If you want to combine red, green, blue and make it multicoloured, that's absolutely fine. Okay, well done everybody. They look really good. And I hopefully it's something that you'd find accessible in a classroom or with obviously lots of them. Because obviously when you finish, you could use this for a couple of lessons if you wanted to. So I've even used water to wash it down and just to leave it there to dry if you want to use it the next day. Or you can literally peel it up and obviously throw it away once you've finished. But it can be used quite a few times and um, before you do have to get rid of it as well. Thank you, Gemma. I'm going to hand over to Rachel, who's going to introduce the breakout rooms. Um, I think there is a question to be posed that we'd like you um, perhaps to explore with some of your colleagues this morning. Thank you. Thanks, Jean. Yes. So we've got half an hour to the end of the session, but we wanted to leave time for questions at the end and also feedback from the discussion. So OK, let me get the question into the chat. So discuss an area of your curriculum you feel would benefit from being extended or broadened. For example, if you cover the ancient Egyptians each year, um, how could you adapt the art lessons delivered as part of this topic in a more open ended way? So it's quite a broad question. So we're not, you know, we know that's a big question to talk about in a group with just a few minutes. But just just going by some of the things that we've done today, some of the some of the processes that you've been engaged with, just try and think of ways that might push a little bit at the edges of what you're already delivering in your class, thinking about how we can layer things and extend things over longer periods of time. Okay, I think we're all back. Uh, I hope that was useful. I'm sorry if it felt a little kind of whistle stop, but I think often these, these sessions do end up feeling that, you know, you, you feel as if you've got a lot of time and then suddenly you haven't got very much time at all. We'd really like um, for Gemma and Rachel just to take some feedback from you um, in relation to the discussions that you've had in breakout rooms. Is there anybody from breakout room one who'd like to giving us a little bit of feedback from your group and, and anybody else please chip in? Please chip in. Um, yeah, it was interesting because my provision that I work in is quite different to I think a lot of the people here. So I teach year seven through to year 14 in a specialist provision for students with autism, ADHD and really complex learning needs, behavioural difficulties. Um, so for me, hearing other people's challenges around how to measure progress whilst keeping a subject open ended and allowing that explore element you know, because I've got the experience of writing that curriculum, um, I think was really interesting and hearing about, you know, whereas I typically wouldn't work with a class of more than 12 due to their need, other people are sort of working with a range of need in a class of 30. Um, so that was interesting. Yeah. What, um, Luke, you were in that, sorry, you were in that group. What, what would, what were the, perhaps the challenges that, that came up in relation to progress? Uh, well, it was because a lot of children are afraid of kind of making mistakes. And I was saying that there's in every class, there's some kind of, you know, all the children think that there is a child who is amazing at art. Uh, however, all the work that the children do is kind of should be appreciated because it is subjective. So that was the kind of challenge I was challenge I was, I was thinking about when it came to right. program. Yeah. Um, any any observations, Rachel or, or, or Gemma, about this this? this hurdle that we have with young children, um, with children not exactly. liking making mistakes or perceived mistakes. Yeah, and I think one thing that I do try and always encourage in schools, and it's not, so obviously drawing is an element of my background, but kind of, I'd always try and avoid, if possible, kind of copying, so copying an artist's work, or even kind of sometimes it's quite tricky doing like a still life as such, I think when you kind of transport it more into an element of print pattern and you kind of celebrate the creativity and what they've produced and what they've explored opposed to drawing something accurately, I think that's a really 
big thing that kind of needs to happen in skills. Because then sometimes you find, um, I was teaching a group just the other day and somebody that isn't technically very proficient at drawing, um, they're obviously okay, but the person in the group that was very, very good at drawing didn't create the print that another boy did. And this other print was just fantastic because he got into it and he used all types of lines and tones and to kind of celebrate what they've produced in a more of a creative way opposed to drawing something accurately. Because to be honest, it's not something I ever really look for. I kind of want to see their take on it. I want to see, and when whilst I was at university and even when I was teaching at university, the thing that you'd always look for is their handwriting in drawing. And it's a really important thing that everybody should have a unique handwriting, as in my handwriting is very different to another person's. So you should be able to see whose is who. Like it should never look like anybody else's. They need to work on producing their own style of what they want to do and how they want to draw. I suppose it's 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 encouraging and messaging that really through the work that you do, isn't it? Could we could we go to group room two? Oh yeah, Susie, you were in room two. Are you yeah. able to feedback? Um, well, from a sort of a museum point of view, um, we have students that come in and use inspiration as part of a gallery tour, um, looking at a topic, say for instance, pattern power or fashion or Tudors or Stone Age, anything like that. And everything that we do and we observe, um, we then create with through a practical activity and I always encourage them to have their own unique spin on it, even though they're following a sequence of processes, a bit like printing, the outcome will always be different to their friends because they have a different view on things, they take it at a different angle. And again, it's very much um, their own piece. So, um, and also it covers a lot of differentiation, sort of have that sort of mindset behind you and that knowledge to experiment and explore. Great. I guess instead of looking at a still life, you've made discoveries through collections and um, artifacts. So yeah. that's another that's another way of sort of developing ideas and patterns and your own sort of handwriting in drawing, really. Yeah. Yeah. And craft it taps really well into the whole conversation surrounding mm. opportunity. I mean, you know, in the last comments as well about you know, one child not necessarily um, excelling in a drawing activity, but when it comes to translating that to, like Gemma was saying, to pattern and print, then that child really finds their light, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, engaging with museums, visiting museums, handling collections, all of that, all of those opportunities absolutely are such a valuable part of broadening your art curriculum. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I think if, if that would just be a takeaway, really, wouldn't it? Just that it's just sort of op literally opening out, looking out beyond the school walls. Um, yeah. And making sure that every child has got the opportunity at some point to find what, what their, um, what, you know, the area that they really excel in or, or naturally lean to or prefer or, you know, just find their creative voice more readily. Because um, it won't be the same for one child and the other and that's what's good about art as well as that you know we, there's attainment targets on the national curriculum but it's there isn't a sort of set by year three every child must be at this standard you know because it completely depends <laughs> um yeah. yeah thank you okay so um finally i think we had room four with um alice and lisa and rebecca is there anyone who like to give us some feedback or reflections on on your discussion in that group Rebecca? Hi. We were just really discussing, um, one, just broadening the curriculum. So what we did the previous year to be able to develop on that. Also, I mean, I was saying myself, the ideas today, like our topic at the moment is rainforest and with the printing and the watercolour ideas could really build that up with our topic rainforest, which will be lovely. But also I was saying my issue was as well with school and art was uh, these lovely ideas and developing the ideas is time you know we do art for six weeks for one half term and then the next half term we move on to kind of design and technology so it gets frustrating because you just don't have that time you know because once the children do start getting into uh, into the artwork and and yeah you plan ideas but it does go one way or the other and then you think oh I could do this from this and we could you know move on from here to there etc 
and it is it just really you kind of end up being a little bit yeah limited but it is I mean got picked up some great ideas today that yeah we can I can share because I've actually got a staff meeting I'm doing on sketchbooks tomorrow so I can <laughs> store some ideas that's great as well <laughs> thank you so yeah yeah, time time is a real challenge, and and if you are on an alternate curriculum where you're doing mm. BT and art, it's really really challenging. Yeah, um, I think the only thing I'd say to that is, despite that, whatever time you do have, you've got you know don't dart around too much. So you know you can you know like for example if you're looking at rainforests, you know you still would have six weeks. So it might not mean that you they the kids engage in every single possible type of way they can creatively work with rainforests um, it may be that you choose two or three processes within that six week block yeah we tend, to, to, we tend to stick to it like a technique so it's painting what you know and then yeah, yeah and they can bring in you know techniques have already come across before you know into that as well but we do so it, yeah so we are focused on something yeah so brilliant I just really like to say a very big thank you to both Gemma and Rachel for all of the three sessions that they've done. And for those of you that have been able to attend all three, that's been brilliant. Um, they've been incredibly insightful and I think full of techniques and um, skills that teachers can take into their classroom. So huge thanks from me. Uh, thank you to everybody who's been with us this morning. Thanks for your time. If you could leave us a little comment in chat, that would be fantastic as you as you leave us. Keep an eye on the Culture Bridge website for up and coming events that you might be interested in. Great to hear from some of you that you're looking at Arts Award with your students as well. Um, and obviously art activities really lend themselves to discover and explore, particularly in a primary school. Um, so if you want any more information about any of that, contact Culture Bridge or have a look at the Culture Bridge website make sure that you're on their newsletter list so that you get an email with events that are coming up and things that are happening. It's a great way to keep in touch um, with what's, what's going on and what, what opportunities there are out there for you. Thank you very much.